Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. CBS News, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Bill Harwood, CBS News. How are you guys doing? How do you hear me? Hear you loud and clear, Bill. We're doing great. Hey, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. And, uh, and Scott, I think I'm going to start with you. I mean, standard question for a guy up in space for nearly a year. How's it going? I mean, you're nearing the halfway point anyway, but uh, how, how are things proceeding for you? You know, things are going great. Uh, in about two weeks, I'll come up on the uh, you know the amount of time I was here uh, on my flight last time, which was 159 days. I think I'm about 143 right now. Um, you know, I have a lot of energy. I'm uh, able to focus. I, th I, th I think I have a pretty good attitude about it. Uh, a year's a long time, but I'm still uh, you know looking forward to the the rest of this flight. And we got a lot of great great things coming up that we're going to do. And it's uh, you know it's been a great experience so far. Well, you know, as someone looking in from the outside, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks, Gennady Padalka, your Soyuz commander, is going to be heading back to Earth. And you and Mikhail Kornienko, of course, are going to be staying to complete your mission. And it strikes me that'll be quite a moment. I mean, most astronauts would be thinking about coming home right now or packing or something like that. But you and Mikhail will be looking ahead to what amounts to an entirely new mission. Um, I just wonder how you look at that, how you process that. Seems kind of daunting to me. It's kind of well, I think Misha and I will both be very upset with Gennady when he leaves us and maybe a little bit envious. But, uh, you know, I think that's – I'm just kind of – I'm kidding there. But, uh, you know, Gennady, we'll definitely miss him. He's a, a great uh, crew member, been, has been a great commander. Um, but I think it to, I think your perception and, and what you're, you're anticipating, I guess, uh, you know, how – you know, the length you're anticipating is what's uh, really important and kind of – you know, maybe affects your fatigue level. I think there is that kind of two-thirds uh, phenomena where, you know, when you get two-thirds of the way into something you, and you can start seeing the end from where you are, that's when maybe in a flight like this the fatigue might build up. I was worried that maybe that was really just at the at the three- or four-month point that would happen, but I, I think it really is, you know, it's based on what your expectations are. And my expectation coming this was, it was a year, so... Uh, you know, I don't feel like I, I should be coming home right now, which is a good thing. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, you've been asked about this in almost every interview, and, and I like your, your strategy of I guess you count up instead of counting down. Uh, you mentioned you still have a lot of energy and you're positive. Is there anything that is wearing on you a little bit uh, as you think ahead? You know, I certainly miss a lot of things on Earth without question, but I think, you know, that's the case with anyone who's been up here for a long time. Um, you know, actually, I'll, I'll quote Gennady again, and he, he, he puts it very well. He says, when you're, you're in space, you dream of, uh, or when you're on Earth, you dream of being in space, and when you're in space, you dream, in, you, you dream of being on Earth. Um, so, you know, it depends on where you are. You, you kind of wish you were in the other place. You know, I do sense a little little bit of that, but, uh, you know, I understand the importance of this mission. We're doing a lot of great stuff up here, a lot of science, 400 different science experiments while I'm here over the year. So, uh, you know, I, I just recognize, uh, you know, the importance of this, how this is part of our, our future journey to Mars. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. Well, let me ask you one more quick one about science before I get to Chell here. Uh, I don't want to ask you to review all the science you guys are doing up there because we'd be here for days, but... I will ask you about the vision research. Um, I know you were doing some of that earlier today, or at least so I was told. I'm, I'm just curious, is there anything going on with your eyesight that's noticeable to you? I actually think it's uh, noticeably a little bit better. Um, I would say you know, I didn't quite look at the, look at the data, uh, although I actually got my, some of my results today, just the, you know, the 2020 kind of data. I was just curious. But I think my uh, I think it's a little better than it uh, it was on the ground, and a little bit uh, you know better than it was earlier in the mission. I think I did have a little bit of an effect early on, but uh, now um, you know I I it doesn't seem to uh, have as much of an impact. I'm actually thinking about maybe on a spacewalk not wearing my glasses, which uh, you know I normally wear those for both uh, reading and a little bit of a distance correction, but the 
you know, the, the distance vision seems like it's gotten a little bit better, so I might go without. That's really interesting. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, Chell, let me ask you a couple here. Uh, you know, you've spent years and years on the road to becoming an astronaut, and now you're 25 days or so into your first mission. Can you give us a sense of your first impressions? I mean, what were you thinking that first day aboard station when you were finally alone at the end of the day, kicking back and just knowing you were finally there? Well, you know, it's uh, this really kind of represents for a lot of the people that come up here a dream come true. And, I mean, this is just a, an incredible place to be, an incredible place to live and work. And uh, so the rocket ride, of course, was amazing. Um, but after docking and coming through that hatch, coming into the space station that we see on television, you know, we train in a mock-up in, uh, in Houston. But to come into this actual thing, to float into this, was just uh, exhilarating and almost overwhelming. Just the fact that, you know, that uh, the, the crew that I came up with, um, Oleg and Kimmy and I, were actually up here. And, uh, you know, the, the time that we've spent up here these past 25 days have been incredible. Getting to look down at the Earth, getting to learn how to live and work in this environment, um, how to keep things organized and not make a mess of myself when I'm eating. What's been the biggest surprise for you so far? You know, I, th the, I think the biggest surprise for me is how quickly, me personally, but talking with Kimia as well, how quickly we adapt to this environment. You know, floating, being in this, uh, this microgravity environment see, it would seem so foreign, and yet I think after really a couple of weeks it, it feels almost natural. And, uh, and it doesn't seem like it should, should be that way. It, it should always kind of remain novel and, and new, but you know, we, I think your brain just kind of adapts to it, accepts that, hey, this is the new um, reality, and, uh, and you, you start to thrive. What's the most fun for you? I mean, is that it? Is weightlessness it? If you, somebody asks you what's the most fun? You know, I think the, the most fun thing for me, aside from uh, being able just to do something like that whenever you feel like it, is uh, being able to share, share this experience. And so I try and keep in touch with friends and family through email and um, using the phone and, uh, and try to, to share some of uh, what I'm discovering uh, on Twitter and through social media just to share, you know, the things that we get to see and do up here. Scott, what about you? You're more than 300 days of space experience, I guess, at this point. What's the most fun for you? You know, a lot of this, uh, y y there's one thing that I like about flying in space uh, more than anything else. And, you know, m some people might think it's looking at the Earth or, or uh, you know, floating around. And, um, you know, like Chell put it, in some ways you kind of get used to that. What I like is the challenge of the, just doing the mission in general, uh, you know, how... What we do is so complicated. You know, we do it with a great group of people, not only here on board with our with our crewmates, but also all the folks on the ground, the people in mission control, the people that train us, the engineers, and it's the uh, you know the sense of accomplishment I get from it. It's uh, you know someday I don't know when that'll be, but uh, you know when I'm done doing this, um, you know it's something I'm really going to miss that uh, sense of satisfaction you get from working hard at something that's hard and then uh, you know being successful at it. Well, let me shift gears for uh, briefly and ask you guys a couple of operational questions. You're going to have nine people on board early next month, which hadn't happened in a while. I mean, visitors are rare. I assume you're looking forward to that. I wonder how crowded it is on the station and uh, what you're looking forward to about that. Well, we are really looking forward to this uh, this next crew that's coming up and is going to be spending um, – about 10 days up here. Of course, uh, Gennady will take that Soyuz home and, and uh, Sergei will stay up here with us. But having uh, that group of people up here, you know, back uh, when the shuttle was flying, um, we would often have many more than that uh, up here. The, the space station is a, is a large volume and it's and uh, there's plenty of room uh, for, this, for this extra crew, for this crew of nine um, that we're going to have up here at, at one time. Um, and it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's fun to, to, to have folks up here, and it's going to be great to see Andy uh, Mogensen come through the door and uh, just see him experiencing uh, what Kimmy and I experienced for the first time uh, just a month ago. You know, guys, this has been a, a tumultuous several months in terms of station resupply with those back-to-back -back failures of, a, of progress in April and then a SpaceX Dragon cargo ship. You guys have had a successful progress flight since then. 
But how important is tomorrow's Japanese HTV launch to build up uh, the station's reserves again? Yeah, it's pretty important. You know, uh, we're we're in good shape right now, but uh, you know, if for some reason HTV didn't get here, we we get pretty low on certain consumables, uh, probably in sep late September, early October time frame. I'm sure we would figure out ways to bridge the gap on those uh, those things and get us to a uh, you know orbital or SpaceX, whichever one makes it first, or even you know get some supplies up here on a on a progress. But if for some reason you know HTV gets delayed for a significant amount of time or something else happens, we do uh, we do run into some issues at that point. You know we've been pretty good about dealing with those things, and and I'm sure we will. You know we would figure out a way around it. But it is a very important launch for us coming up. Well, I misspoke. Obviously, that launch is Wednesday, not Tuesday. But, but you know, one of the questions I jotted down was, could station support a six-man crew, six-person crew, I should say, if you had another resupply failure this calendar year? I mean, no one expects that, obviously. But if it happened, do you think you could keep six people up there in, in terms of the workarounds you're talking about? Or do you think there'd be some chance you might have to go back down to three for a while? You know, um, of course... As uh, as Scott said, this is this is an important launch. This ATV, HTV launch is important, but um, I'm confident the ground would uh, find figure out ways to to make sure that uh, we stayed supplied and uh, and, and safe and uh, and that we had the capabilities that we need to to do the science and the work up here that we need to do. Um, and if we didn't have enough supplies, we'd have to deal with that deal with that situation uh, when it came up. Well, of course, uh, you know, commercial resupply, actually any resupply is just one aspect of station operations. Uh, you know, NASA is also developing commercial cruise ships uh, to end the sole reliance on the Soyuz, but Congress seems reluctant to fund that program. You know, it's almost like a catch-22. You know, Congress is saying Soyuz contract extensions are evidence the agency doesn't have confidence in Boeing and SpaceX that they'll get there. NASA is saying, well, we have to extend Soyuz because Congress hadn't funded us. Um, what's going on there? I mean, how important is getting commercial crew up and running? Are you guys worried about that? You know, I, I think, you know, everything you said is, is pretty much true. You know, we, uh, we need funding to get a commercial crew capability, and, and you know, we didn't get what we asked for this time. And then we had to, you know, secure some more uh, Soyuz uh, seats through extending that contract uh, to have our crew members get up here. So commercial crew is very important to us. You know, if, uh, you know, I hope we'll get there with the current funding. I don't think we'll get there on the current uh, schedule, obviously, um, or the schedule that we, we would have liked. But uh, it is very important. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, people will recognize this and, uh, and give NASA the support we need to get it done. Are you at all worried that, uh, that, that this funding scenario might, might force NASA to down-select to just one provider, and would that be a concern to you? You know, I really hadn't considered that. I, you know, I'm not involved in the commercial crew program right now, at least, and, uh, you know, I had not given that much thought, but, uh, you know, now that you mention it, yeah, that is a, uh, you know, obviously that would be a concern, and that I think would maybe be a likely outcome that kind of makes sense that if you don't have enough money, you might have to down-select to one sooner than you would like. And I would imagine that that would eat into some of your, you know, your mar margin for success. You know, if you have two uh, vehicles being built and uh, one of them doesn't work out, um, you know, you still got the other one. And down-selecting earlier than we like would probably, uh, you know, make that a... Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily less safe, but uh, you, you know, less a, uh, you know, less of a likelihood that we'll get the vehicle that we want in the time that we would want if we have to make those decisions sooner. Well, just one more along those lines. Uh, you know, one of the uh, criticisms, I guess, from some politicians anyway, is the, the nature of commercial contracts is they worry about safety, lack of oversight at NASA and safety. But you guys are the ones who are going to be trusting your lives on these things. Um, what are your thoughts about flight safety? Are you guys uh, comfortable with the, the commercial contracting uh, setup uh, to ensure your safety? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So, you know, we call this a commercial crew capability, and, you know, NASA didn't build the space shuttle. The space shuttle was built by Rockwell with, uh, you know, pretty significant NASA oversight. But, you know, Boeing built the space station. I mean, most of the 
the USOS hardware up here is uh, Boeing, a lot, you know, Lockheed Martin, a bunch of different aerospace companies. NASA generally doesn't cut metal on things and put things together. We, we manage the programs, we design, uh, we test. But as far as the actual building, that is has been, you know, throughout the history, I think, of the space program less left to commercial companies. Now, in this case, we're doing something different in that we're not having as much oversight and we're not the manager of the program. So um, there, you know, it is it is conducted differently. So, uh, you know, we have to put different kinds of safeguards into things. But, you know, I, like I said earlier, I'm not that familiar with the details, but I think... You know, safety is very important to NASA. It's one of their, our most important things, it is, if not the most important thing. And I think uh, we are putting the appropriate safeguards to build a vehicle with a, a commercial uh, contractor without the kind of typical or historical oversight that we've had. Well, thanks. Let me, uh, I've got about four minutes left. I want to shift gears once again and ask you a, a question about social media, which is, playing an increasing role, it seems. I mean, I sit here on my computer every day and see pictures you guys uh, tweet out, which are pretty stunning. I was I'm especially impressed by those night shots you guys take of the aurora and star fields against the limb of the earth, that sort of thing. Uh, how, how do you do that? How do you pull off those shots? They're really quite spectacular. They're really quite spectacular. Well, like I said previously, you know, that's one of the, the joys up here is to get to share some of the views that, that we get to experience. And uh, so, first of all, we get great training on the ground and, and cameras and, and using uh, the video cameras and the other assets that we have, have up here. We've got uh, great uh, equipment up here to, to use, and we've got great views. I mean, um, we're above the atmosphere, and so we have the, these clear views of the stars and, uh, and really spectacular views of of some of the phenomenon that uh, that you don't quite get to, to behold on the ground, the auroras. You know, you get if you're lucky and live in the southern and northern hemisphere extremes, uh, you might get to see the aurora. But to be up here and to get to see kind of the the oversight of it um, is pretty amazing. Scott, how about you? You you sent down some truly spectacular sunset and sunrise pictures. That uh, a couple of those have made my iPhone home screen. Yeah, those are, you know, some of the, the, the pictures we take, that's how it looks with your eyeball, like the, the sunrise and the sunset. Others, the camera obviously makes it look better, you know, like the aurora. I mean, the aurora is spectacular with looking at, at it with your eyes, but the camera does, and the settings of the camera can, does make it look better. Same thing with some of the Earth shots. The Earth's spectacular, but... You know the way you use the camera can can enhance that, and uh, you know I think people enjoy that. People like you know beautiful pictures, and uh, you know if we could make them a little bit more beautiful with the equipment we have up here, you know I think that's uh, you know some artistic license I take, and uh, I'm glad you know people like yourself and other people enjoy it. Yeah, no question about that. Well, listen, I've got one last question, or time for one last question, and I'll go back to politics one last time. I'm sure that's your favorite topic, but anyway, you know, space hasn't really been on the political agenda so far with the presidential candidates. Uh, Donald Trump said over the weekend that he thinks a flight to Mars would be, quote, wonderful, but, quote, I want to rebuild our infrastructure first, which I don't know what to make of that. But anything, anything you guys would like to say to all the folks that are out there throwing their hat in the ring for president about space and, uh, and the need to, to support uh, your all's objectives? Well, you know, historically, NASA's gotten um, not universally bipartisan support, but we do we do get bipartisan support, and uh, you know we really appreciate that. Um, you know, we could always use more money. Uh, you know, we're going to do the best with the money we're given, and uh, you know, when you look at the overall uh, budget of the uh, you know the U.S. budget, NASA gets a very small part of that, and. Uh, and, you know, I think space is an investment in our future. I think, you know, what we get from even, you know, building a space station, uh, the economic return, the science return is very, very important to, uh, you know, to our nation, to our economy. So, you know, I would like to see all the candidates really support us. And I think they, you know, they probably do uh, in, in some regard, but also support a, a, a a bigger budget like you were talking about with the uh you know the commercial crew and being able to you know build that vehicle on the on the time frame that we uh we we need to to uh you know to support our our space station missions and our 
you know, and our, our, our future missions. You know, we need, we need to be able to put that money into the, the U.S. economy, into U.S. companies, and aerospace companies, uh, versus sending it overseas. So I hope, I hope they would see that. Guys, thank you very much. i got to wrap up. I look forward to talking to you again down the road, and, uh, and have fun up there. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, CBS News Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.